your percentage of time that you can ask from an executive should be directly proportional to the level of benefit they get from your product. So if you're mm. the payroll software and mm -hmm. your executive sponsor is the director of payroll, their job's 100% reliant on your software. Like it, yep. you play a huge part in their day to day and they really mm -hmm. care and they want to know and they want an opportunity to ask questions. Mm -hmm. If you are, you know, a plugin for Zoom that has cute emojis, like no one wants to talk to you. And once again, welcome to the Digital Customer Success Podcast with me, Alex Turkovich. So glad you could join us here today and every week as I seek out and interview leaders and practitioners who are innovating and building great scaled CS programs. My goal is to share what I've learned and to bring you along with me for the ride so that you get the insights that you need to build and evolve your own digital CS program. If you'd like more info, want to get in touch or sign up for the latest updates, go to digitalcustomersuccess.com for now. Now, let's get started. Hello and welcome to the Digital Customer Success Podcast. It's so great to have you back uh, as usual. Um, if you're listening to this quote unquote live, uh, you have basically today and tomorrow because it's January 30th. Uh, so you have till the end of day, January 31st to enter to win a, um, a gold pass to the Customer Success Festival that's happening in Austin next month in February. Um, so the instructions for how to enter are down in the description. So if you want to enter, you got two days left, get at it. Um, if the time has passed and you are now in February, but the event hasn't happened yet, uh, just drop me a message on LinkedIn or, um, send me an email, alex at digitalcustomersuccess.com and I'll shoot you a 20% off code that you can use to get into the event. Um, that aside, if you're listening to this way in the future, it means nothing to you. Um, so it's time to get into today's conversation with none other than Annie Dean. Uh, this was a, an, an amazing conversation because uh, she has such a wealth of history in CS. I mean, she's kind of like an she's a she's a CS OG. She spent a lot of time at LinkedIn and Cisco and uh, a few other places. Uh, Coursera, I think, as well. I'm just building CS chops and being early to market with like digital customer success before it was called digital customer success. These days you can find her at Recast Success where she's been a few years um, with her co-founder focused on building CS careers, um, focused on career transitioners and providing workshops and certifications for folks who want to get into CS. And the best part about it is they're focused on um, diversity. They're focused on gender and uh, racial equity and really making CS as diverse as possible, which I absolutely love. And we do talk about that a little bit. Um, but we also spend a ton of time on just tactical advice and real world examples of, um, you know, just great digital CS best practices. Lots of goodies in this conversation. I hope you enjoy it. I certainly did. Here we go with Annie Dean. <laughs> Annie, I am so happy that you're here. Welcome to the podcast. It's great to have you. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to chat with you. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there, there's a number of reasons why I reached out, um, you know, just because you're, um, I, you're primarily the stuff that you do with Recast Success is like um, such kind of fundamentally cool and awesome and like the mission that you're on is great. So I definitely want to dig into that. But um, before we kind of get going, I'd, I'd love to get a sense for kind of who you are, where you came from, what got you into CS, like that whole kind of journey that we all take that's never a direct line into CS. <laughs> totally, totally. Yeah. And I was pretty early days, so mm -hmm. all of my generation of CS people, we all were career transitioners coming from other places. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I did over a decade in retail and wholesale leadership, um, which I really enjoyed, but was ready to have a better quality of life and have a bigger impact and more scale. I really wanted to get into tech and it was mm -hmm. tough. You know, like I didn't know how to market myself. I didn't have the right connections. Um, I applied for probably over a year before, you know, even though I had 10 years of leadership experience, I'd run big businesses. Yeah. Um, I had to start over again at an, like an entry level job. Um, right. So I started at Cisco 
as a project coordinator <laughs> um, and, you know, luckily moved up really, really quickly uh, as part of their um, learning at Cisco. So customer education yeah. and got pretty quickly drafted in to start uh, the customer education function, which was basically digital CS yeah. uh, at LinkedIn in like 2013. Right. Uh, and, you know, when we rebranded to customer success back then, <laughs> so it was a brand, brand new field at that point. It's so funny how, um, well, I mean, I say this all the time that, you know, digital CS isn't necessarily a new concept. It's, it's you know, taking things that we've done as companies forever, like email marketing and in-product and all that kind of stuff. And it's like wrapping it around the customer journey, essentially. But it's so cool how, um, you know, you said it, it was essentially digital customer success because that's what it was. It's what it's, it's been around for a while. It just has a name now. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. We, you know, we were brought on my tiny little team to address no and low touch solutions because, you know, the company had been around for a long time, but their B two B business was actually pretty new. Yeah, uh, it was under a hundred million. Had been going for I think maybe three years or so. They were seeing double digit um, churn, <laughs> and everyone was getting high touch white glove service because they were figuring it out as they went. You right, know, the industry was brand new. So throwing bodies uh, at we it. We came on to try and invent all of the no and low touch strategies that we could roll out. So we didn't have to just hire a thousand CSMs to keep yeah. up with the growth rate. Cause we went from a hundred million to a billion in that first two years. Um, <sighs> and then to 2 billion about a year and a half after that. So it's, it's rare on this ride. podcast. In fact, you might be the first one to ever mention billion on this podcast. So congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I feel honored. <laughs> yeah. That's a big number. Um, that's a big number. So, okay. Being that we are on the Digital CS Podcast, I ask all my guests the same question. And um, I would love to get your kind of elevator pitch on it because everybody has a different take. And you have a probably a more historically relevant take on where things have been and whatnot. So what, in your opinion, if you had to sum it up in 10, 30 seconds, what, what is Digital CS? Yeah, and we, you know... We talk about this a lot um, and you know, I feel like it's bringing the right communication to the right person at the right moment in time in a, a scaled, low, no touch kind of way. And then using actionable data and insights to prioritize your, your low touch interactions so that you get the highest ROI for those, those interaction points. Mm -hmm. I love that. Um, do you, do you have, um, do you have some insight into what you've used in the past or currently to to get that prioritization right? Like what? I mean, obviously, with an email campaign, you look at you can look at engagement metrics and things like that. That's duh. But like, how are you going about prioritizing those things that need to be done or or emphasizing things that are already being done? Yeah, I mean, we start with a really easy version of a customer lifecycle, right? Which is just like. Get them in, you know, get your end users enrolled, get them using basic functions, get them using advanced functions, yeah. demonstrate the value to the decision maker, um, and then, you know, look for opportunities to uh, expand your relationship. Yeah. And we look at what are the top drivers of fall off at each of those steps along the way, mm -hmm. and how could we address those in a more meaningful way, even if it's just like, try test out one strategy each month <laughs> to try and move the needle. Um, so for example, if the biggest drop off in getting people on and using it for the first time is they don't understand the why bother. Um, if you can't get past that hurdle, they're never going to invest the time to actually come back and learn how to master it and get the full value out of it. So, um, you know, that's usually where we start is like start at the beginning of the journey, mm -hmm. uh, start with some different channels and see which ones stick. Yeah. And, and before we started recording, you and I were kind of joking about the fact that like a lot of people ask, you know, like, how do you get started in digital? And the, and the thing is just start, <laughs> like figure out where you need to go, figure out what you have, just start. And if you fail, Fine. Fail fast, learn some good stuff, and then go on. <laughs> yeah, a hundred percent. I mean, if we had waited for the tools to be invented and all the mm -hmm. analytics to be in place and everything back when we were starting out, we never would have gotten customer success, you know, at scale off the ground. Um, yeah. 
And we didn't always get it right. We absolutely didn't. Sure. <laughs> uh, but, you know, as long as you're learning something each step of the way, mm -hmm. you know, and each time's a little bit better than the time before, then, you know, you're going to get to a really good place a lot well, faster by getting going. The kids these days have it easy because the kids these days, uh, like <laughs> you've got things like Zapier and then all these low cost kind of ways of doing really niche things and you tie them all together. And it's so fun. It's super fun. But yeah. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. People just don't have any idea how good they have it. Mm -hmm. Like <laughs> we would, you know, we're, I, I would have MBA interns digging into this data for me, trying to figure out like, you know, which activity did this person perform on average, like mm. of the customers that churned, what were they doing of the customers that expanded? What were they doing? Like, what were the touch points? We were doing it on like giant Excel files. Like it was ridiculous where yeah. now you can plug it into a CSP or I mean, hell you could drop it into chat GPT, <laughs> drop Probably. some data and you're like, summarize this for me. It's, it's amazing. It was like hardcore regression testing that you were doing. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it wasn't easy, but it was pretty amazing. I got to work with some like just brilliant data scientists and engineers and you know business strategists. It was it was pretty awesome. Yeah, that's cool. So, um, okay, fast forward a bit. Um, recast success. Tell me a little bit about that. What what is your what was the genesis for that? What got you kind of thinking along those lines? And then if you if you want to give us kind of an overview of what you are all about at Recast. It'd be awesome. Sure. Yeah, it's funny. I, you know, we're coming up on, uh, you know, we incorporated almost two years ago, but we've been working on this for two and a half, almost three years. Uh, and my co-founder and I were sitting one day and kind of talking about how challenging it was to hire more diverse customer success folks onto our own teams. We've mm -hmm. both been in CS leadership for quite some time. Um, I wanted more career transitioners, but it's really challenging, right? When you're a hiring manager, you're trusting someone to go out and be the face of your company with hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars of business. Like mm -hmm. it's hard to find people who you can just plug in. So it's always gonna take some resources that as a hiring manager, by the time we get a headcount approved, we're already short staffed. Like yeah. we don't have a ton of resources available to train and develop folks. Um, and we also looked at just the diversity across the industry in general, like the CSMs that were in the market, like everyone's fighting over the same few people that were pretty homogenous. Mm -hmm. uh, and we wanted people that were a better reflection of our customers that really yeah. understood a day in the life. And so we decided, well, heck, <laughs> Let's just uh, create a way to have a better talent funnel of the kind of people that we want to hire onto our own teams. Um, and so when we originally founded this, it was uh, just a boot camp program for mid career professionals um, coming from industries that have highly transferable skills yeah. um, and primarily focused on underrepresented populations. Mm -hmm. That's great. Um, I think that speaks to the thing that you see in CS all the time, which is to say like, there's few people who start in CS and not until recently, could you like go and get a degree? There, there were no degree programs in customer success. So you, you have folks from sales and product and like all different, all different walks of life. Is there, um, this is a weird question and we totally didn't prep for it, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Um, is, is there a, like a, um, is there a previous experience kind of area or skill set that you find lends itself particularly well to somebody becoming a CSM or is it just all over the place? I mean, it's a good question. There's kind of four key pillars to customer success. So we look yeah. for people that have experience in at least two of them. So, you know, one being kind of that implementation project management training function, mm -hmm. two being kind of sales components. Can they do an upsell, a renewal, negotiate a contract? Three is business consulting. Like how well do they understand the companies they'll be working with so that they can provide valuable advice on things like change management, internal communications, you know, all those things that drive adoption and engagement. And then fourth is being the voice of the customer. So, you know, being able to do a root cause yeah. analysis and prioritization and communicate with your product team. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's a lot of different industries that have, you know, components that go along with that. And so, yeah. you know, we look for people 
they need to have at least two out of the four and then we can help train them on the other two as needed. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, some of, uh, I was, I was having some conversations the other day. I forget with who my short-term memory is not great these days. Um, but like, you know, we were talking about what makes a good digital CSM or, or somebody who's, you know, really focused on digital and, and, you know, there was like a combination of little things like there's kind of marketing, like customer marketing elements. There's like data analysis and really understanding how two data sets compare, like, you know, all those kinds of things. Um, and then there's this customer success kind of customer advocacy muscle. Have you found, um, kind of in the in the boot camps that you've done have have you encountered individuals who have been maybe more focused or inclined to go down a more digital kind of path versus traditional one to one to one CSM Yeah I mean I think it's tough cuz a lot of people don't know about digital right yet, <laughs> yet. Um, and so <laughs> yet yes it's definitely gaining in popularity and I completely agree I think yeah. uh Product management feeds well into digital, marketing mm -hmm. feeds well into digital, data science and analytics feeds well into digital. And it's frustrating because a lot of what you see in the job descriptions, hiring managers just don't get it. They're just like, right. I want someone that's been a CSM for five years. I'm like, they don't have any of the skills you actually need to do this job. Nope. <laughs> yeah, sales ops. Like mm -hmm. if I had to pick one field to pull someone into for digital CS, I would take someone from sales ops a yeah. hundred times over. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, that's, that's, that, that's super fascinating. Has, has, um, ha have your goals, um, and the things that you're, you know, aiming to achieve with recast success changed since your founding two years ago, or has it remained pretty steady? Yeah. I mean, it's it's definitely changed. We've expanded quite a bit. Um, mm -hmm. Originally, it was just boot camp, yeah. uh, and you know we help our grads find jobs. Part of that is we have a large volunteer mentor network. They get to participate in our career services, so we always have this really amazing talent pool that's free to hire from. Um, and you know, two things happened from that. One was employers would hire somebody who'd gone through boot camp and go wow, this person's better trained than my CSMs that have been here for a couple of years. Can uh -huh. you do some training with us? Right. So we, we do have an arm that does more B2B training now, working mostly with like private equity and VCs that are, you know, uh -huh. they might see there's a need more than a startup would really know if they don't know what good looks like. <laughs> they don't realize that they don't really have best in class. And so sometimes it's those external advisors that can say, hey, by the way, mm -hmm. um, you guys really are kind of missing the mark on some of these things that could take your your CS team to the next level. Uh, the other area was, um, since we have this uh, talent pool, um, we'd get early stage founders coming to us and they're like, hey, I'm looking to hire. Can you give me an individual contributor who, you know, they're going to have no supervision. We have no tools in place. We have no playbooks in place. And no one here really understands what customer success is. Oh Can you give God. us some names who, I, you know, we'd love to hire? Or the other end of the spectrum was like, you know, we want somebody who's an executive who's built from scale up through like IPO, who is not going to have a team to lead. They're just going to do all the work in the trenches, work mostly for equity for like 60 to 80 hours a week. Um, who do you know? And I'm like, I don't want to sign anyone up to either of these, uh, which is where we founded in January. We started offering a fractional head of customer success program. Mm -hmm. where you, you get someone who's seasoned, who knows what they're doing embedded one day a week, yeah. paired with an individual contributor who is being trained and developed to kind of take on that long-term leadership in the company. That's cool. What a cool model. Um, uh, yeah. <laughs> I couldn't imagine throwing an individual contributor into that environment without any kind of guidance whatsoever or models or, you know, just uh, set up for failure just because somebody says, hey, that customer success thing, I think we need that. <laughs> right. Yeah. And half the time you're talking to these founders and they really have no idea what customer success even no. is. So they're expecting this person to take on absolutely everything post sale. So they're mm -hmm. like, you're going to do support and you might be doing bill collection and yeah. you're going to be doing, you know, a myriad of things. And, and if you get it, I see who hasn't been around very long, they don't know how to push back and no. like 
really help them think about changing the culture of their business to be mm -hmm. more responsive to customers, how to plug in feedback, how to, you know, how to better hone their ICP, their, you know, ideal customer profile based on what's working yeah. with the customers they have. They're just putting out fires and running mm -hmm. around like a chicken with their head cut off. Yeah. So, um, you know, we're hoping to change that model so we can get the fundamentals of what customer success really is yeah. into startups earlier and put them on a good path to have, you know, a really great culture long term. Yeah. So um, put, uh, I'd like to be a kind of a fly in the room, you know, on the wall for a second there. I, I, me and analogies, I get them wrong all the time. Um <laughs> Uh, you've you've just walked into kind of first day, maybe first month of you know a fractional head role, and um, you know spending one day a week. You're you know, maybe meeting some customers. You're you know you're you're kind of getting a lay of the land for what the product is and all those kinds of things. Like at the at what point do you typically say, hey, look? these things should and can be automated versus these things, you know, need a human for now. And, and, the, you know, there, I, I, I get that there's no one recipe, but at what point are you typically starting to advise these founders that, Hey, look, you can get a lot of, a lot done with this type of automation. Yeah, we, we love that we're starting really early stage mm -hmm. so that we can build for that from the beginning. Right. Yeah. So Sometimes they have a CRM in place. Sometimes they don't even have that yet. <laughs> We're right. like advising on, okay, here's the CRM. You need to run your business. And PS, these are the, the features or the service levels that are going to allow us to capture the information that we need and make that, you know, automatable across multiple platforms in the future. So it's kind of helping them see around mm -hmm. corners, mm -hmm. building with that in mind from the very beginning. Um, but, you know, we teach uh, digital CS um, workshops to a lot of our B2B customers too. And, you know, it starts small, right? So we're like, okay, great. You are doing a high touch webinar with a new customer and you're going to walk them through how to use your product. Awesome. Let's take the transcript from that. <laughs> we're going to drop this into ChatGPT and get, yep. you know, 10 articles we could use for your help center and for a newsletter. Mm -hmm. And here's, we'll chop up this video. And for your smaller customers, we can reuse this video segment using this software. So it's like really just thinking about how every action should be replicable and be able to be used at scale. Um, and just starting to embed that culture from hopefully from the very, very beginning. Um, it sounds to me like a lot of times you're, you're encountering not just a CS type situation or CS leadership, but it's really operations. You know, you're kind of advising on what systems they should and should and shouldn't think about and probably advising on what, what they should and shouldn't do with those. Is that a fair assumption? Yeah, I would say when you're head of customer success at a, a startup like pre-seed seed series a your job a lot of your job is operational yeah, totally. <laughs> more than just you know you're setting the foundation to build on top of mm -hmm. um it's not doing just the traditional you know working with customers and um you know yeah making sure that the value proposition is getting communicated clearly it's putting the infrastructure in place so that everyone else can do that going forward yeah or dealing with a haphazard infrastructure that exists that was implemented without a strategy correct yeah <laughs> we can tie it together and clean it up you know yeah. once you've done these for a few startups there's mm -hmm. very common themes you see over and over again that yeah you know most Startups are advised to focus on growth, right? Yeah. Like growth at all costs. If you want to raise your next round of funding, you've got to hit this dollar level. Um, and so if there isn't someone there that has enough credibility, enough authority, you know, uh, and enough experience to talk to them about how to think broader than that, then they won't, you know, like most founders, if there isn't somebody telling them to focus, they have so many other things going on. It's just going to you know, fall by the wayside. So mm -hmm. we try and be that advocate for <laughs> here's how you need to structure for more long-term thinking. If you actually want to keep this revenue, you're fighting so hard to get in the door. That's here right. are the, the fundamentals we need to put in place. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's awesome. So important. Um, and often missed, which is great for you from an opportunity standpoint. <laughs> 
um, you, you know, and, and as you start to think about, you know, what, you know, what this, this company should be putting in place in terms of their customer journey and uh, just the, the, the kind of thinking through what those key, mo key moments are along that customer journey. Are, are there, uh, every company is different. Every software is different. Every, customer segments, all that kind of stuff. But are, do you find that there are key moments that you're advising over and over and over again that, hey, look, this this really needs to be digitally supported or, you know, put some automation behind it to support your humans? Like, are you are you are you finding yourself um, kind of advising on those same moments over and over again? Yeah, I think the biggest miss we see almost every single time is they only think about end users uh, in a reactive way, right? Mm -hmm. So they'll focus on executive sponsors and point of contact, if you're lucky. <laughs> yeah. uh, and then they'll have a reactive uh, motion. Um, you know, maybe there's some implementation work at the very beginning of the contract. And then that's it. There's nothing proactive going out to those end users. And mm -hmm. without the end users actually utilizing and finding value in your product, that you know, the, the bigger outcomes that the executive sponsors care about are never going to happen. So really thinking about how to be more proactive. So we're always telling them, you know, if you think about who's reaching out for support, mm -hmm. um, from a personality standpoint, it's probably only about one in five that need help or reaching out for help. Yeah. The other four out of five are just going to give up. They're like, yeah, this tool sucks. I'm not going to use it mm -hmm. anymore. Yeah. Um, and so if you can't understand what problems they are having that maybe they don't even know they're having mm -hmm. um, and reach out proactively to offer solutions, you're losing a huge percentage of the value of your product. That happens at pretty much every early stage startup. They yeah. just don't put enough thought into that. Right. It's like once it's implemented, you're off to the races or whatever. Next, you know. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, and, it, you know, we know <laughs> turnover in jobs is pretty high. So, yeah. Even if that was true for the population you originally changed, mm -hmm. what happens when there's new hires? What happens, yeah. you know, when there's reorgs and redesigns and all those sure. things? Like training needs to be constant. You mm -hmm. know, communication needs to be constant so that you stay top of mind and you're providing relevant information when they need it. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> we think about onboarding and we think, you know, the word that that word just conjures up this whole notion of, okay, you need to get them set up and stood up and enabled or whatever. We don't think about user onboarding nearly enough, I think, especially in a platform where, you know, maybe you have a lot of users coming and going and, and, and whatnot. That's, that's a huge part of it. Yeah. I mean, the average professional in the U S uses 80 apps <laughs> professionally there's I, no way they're yeah. utilizing the full depth and breadth of the features no. on any of those, probably. Right. So it's not just get them to log in and use it once and magically they're going to see why it's worth investing their time to learn all of the features to get the full benefit. Mm. Um, you know, if you're not proactive about constantly reinforcing why why they should bother to learn something new, like change is hard. Mm -hmm. um, you're fighting for their attention for a a lot of different directions. So if you're yeah. really smart about it, you know, give it to them in bite-sized pieces and keep them coming back for more and help them mm -hmm. help them understand the value of what they've already invested time learning. Yeah, totally. Thinking back, uh, this is a bit of a left turn, but thinking back over all of the kind of work you've done that's kind of digital CS related, is there maybe like is there a program or a specific time or a specific motion that you can point to that you're like, you look back on, you're like, that was really cool. <laughs> um, I'm still a really big fan of semi live webinars. Mm -hmm. um, oh, I love that so much. Yeah. I did that at a previous yeah, place. Yeah. We spent magic. so much time when you're in a rapid growth company and you've got a lot of new customers coming on all the time. I was watching my CSMs go through leading what, you know, 90% of it was exactly the same over and over and over again. And so um, setting up kind of recurring webinar series is where, you know, we're like, we'll just do an onboarding once a week. Everyone who joined that week can go into this onboarding and 80% of it's pre-recorded. We only have to hop on for the last 20% to answer questions. Yeah. Uh, that brought us 
so much bandwidth um, mm-hmm. and delivered more consistency. Like we could make sure that it was the perfect version. You know, nobody had bandwidth issues or audio issues or bad hair day or whatever on that that video um, where we had to do it live every time. There's always things that can go wrong. So totally. it was higher quality and easier for us. So that was one I, I really was pleased to get in place and one that I do again over and over again in other companies as well. I wish I could remember what platform we use, but at a, at a previous employer, we, we um, use this platform that basically you, re, you pre-record your webinar like soup to nuts. It feels completely live. Um, you pepper in some kind of like fake questions in the chat from fake people just to kind of get the conversation going. But then on the back end, you have um, an actual human manning the chat that's going on while this webinar is happening so that you can actually interact with it. So so literally from a staffing perspective, to your point, you didn't have to get quaffed. You didn't have to go to the studio. You didn't have to turn your lights on and get your mic set up and do all that kind of stuff. You just had to make sure you, you had somebody in the live chat ready to go to answer questions. And that was, um, that was such a cool thing because, you know, I think a lot of times when we go to implement some of these digital motions, the first thing that can kind of leave is the personality and the the human element of it, you know? And it's hard to be human over email unless you're like super creative about your copy and spend a lot of time on that. But I think, you know, those kinds of things still allow you to, you know, present a sense of who you are as a brand and who you are as a company while at the same time being efficient with the resources that you have. Yeah, it's emails, you know, I don't know about you, but I I don't have positive, warm, fuzzy vibes when I open my inbox in the morning and there's 300 <laughs> emails in there, you know, mm-hmm. there's nothing that's popping up that I'm like, oh, I'm excited to read this from whatever mm-hmm. vendor, you know, so yeah, I, I always push to try and think beyond the email cadences and, and all of mm-hmm. that, like, what other ways can we connect? What other channels are employees and customers already on that we can tap into that they're more likely to be participating in and feel positively about participating in. Yeah, totally. I love vendors that can make me laugh over email. Like they'll have my business forever, (laughs) but a few far between. (laughs) They are few and far between. Maybe with ChatGPT or like AI, uh, people get better at that. I don't know. (laughs) Maybe. Yeah. As the better those tools get. Um, are there kind of today you've kind of fast forwarding to today i know you you know you you probably see quite a bit and you interact with a lot of different com- organizations and leaders and things like that are there um are there cool things that you're seeing out there right now that you're really excited about um that are related yeah mm-hmm. yeah for sure um yeah, all these companies we work with are always asking for advice on yeah. on what tools they should be thinking about and uh-huh. so we take a lot of demos and <laughs> attend sure. a lot of trade shows. We're kind of looking at what's out there. A um, couple of the ones I'm really excited about. Well, and I'll, let me take a step back. Mm-hmm. Part of what we do is not just look at tools that are already for customer success. Unfortunately, most of the innovation, it doesn't happen for customer success, right? right. Like if you go on G2, there's over 15,000 tools for sales there's like 30 something for customer success. Yeah, so unreal. we try and do is talk to founders a little earlier in their journey, try and pivot them towards mm. actually making it built for a customer success perspective. Yeah. Um, and like purpose built instead of us having to later go and try and adapt something that wasn't really built for us. Mm-hmm. Um, so one example of that, um, I'm working with a company called uh, Agent Copilot (laughs) that I discovered at Faster. Mm -hmm. And um, they were building for marketing. It's a, it's kind of a a loom style video that uses deep fakes. So you can like create a, uh, an avatar of yourself, your video and your voice uh, in a few minutes. And then you can create scripts, um, that will connect to your CSP or your CRM and can like inform what goes into that script to personalize it and then create a video from your CSM that looks exactly like your CSM across your entire customer base. So you could do a thousand custom videos in a few minutes instead of recording a thousand looms. 
That one I'm really excited about because we talked them into going the CS route instead of the marketing route. <laughs> is that is that also um, the one that that does the translation really well? Which one is that? No, that's Hey Jen. That's definitely that's on my hey list Jen. as well. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, I love that. We spent so much time at LinkedIn, especially because we were global. Uh, we covered 47 different languages, mm. and so. When I left there, we were doing about 350 webinars every month in 27 different languages just to try and cover the most of our population. Um, we spent so much money <laughs> uh, and had so many resources to try and cover all this language. Like, hey, Jen would have been absolutely revolutionary for absolutely. us. And yeah. Yeah. Amazing. I love that. Um, Vidiate, I think, is really cool. I don't uh -huh. know if you've seen them. I have, yeah. But that was another thing. Customer education, like one of our big pain points is product changes probably every two weeks. Like, yep. how do you keep all your materials up to date? Um, mm -hmm. So theirs does, you know, I think all of these need some work. Like none of them are 100% there perfect. yet. But like yeah. the direction they're going, I'm really excited. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, Vidiate is... Uh, is you know, again, it's solving a problem that a lot of, you know, large training organizations, well, part of the reasons they're so large is because they've had to support this kind of, you know, level of quality of video creation and, and all of that kind of stuff that that is now just like, at the tip of your finger. Um, and what's interesting about it, when I, th when I really think about these things is, um, you know, you mentioned that, they're not quite there yet, or that you know they still have some maturing to do, and I I totally agree with that because I don't I don't for once think that you could use any of these tools to a replace your CSM. We don't. That's not what they're there for. Um, or b like just be the CS function for you. I think they're all tools to augment what you do and to make your humans like more efficient and more effective. And you, you have to kind of really lead into that. Like, hey, we've got this virtual assistant or we have this persona named Bob and he's going to talk to you every once in a while about the health of your account. This isn't me. This is, you know, it's like we almost have to like use it as as a tool. And, and you know, I, I don't know where I'm going with this, but it's like, um, <laughs> it, it's like, it, it's it's not there yet, nor do I really want it to be there where it's like you're just putting an avatar with Gen AI in front of uh, a customer for all of your CS needs. But what it does do is it takes some of the mundane, makes it entertaining, makes it fun, puts it in front of the customer when they need it, where they need it. And your CSM can then focus on having like those really high value conversations that you know, and strategic conversations. I think that's where I wanted to go with that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think about it like maybe graphic design, like mm. 90s and before probably most designers were designing print media, right? Like yeah. they're sending out postcards, they're putting up flyers, they're doing billboards, whatever. Um, and then all of a sudden, you know, graphic design, digital graphic design got a lot easier. You didn't have to be an engineer to do it. You can no. use templates, you can drag and drop, you can change the colors, all those things. It doesn't mean there were no more designers. It just yeah. meant that they could be a lot more effective, a lot more creative mm -hmm. and reach way more people. So have higher impact. And that's kind of how I think about, you know, AI affecting the, the digital CS landscape. Yeah, yeah. Just because you have a Canva subscription doesn't make you a good designer. You can you can make crap in Canva too. <laughs> <laughs> True, I do it all the time. Yeah, yeah, totally. Oh, <laughs> uh, that's awesome. Um, as we kind of start to round things down a little bit or wind things down a little bit, what's um, you, you've you've mentioned some apps and some technology that you're really excited about. Are there um, some people that are doing cool things in digital that you might want to you know, give a shout out to or point out or give a high five to virtually? Yeah, I mean, I, a lot of what I do is kind of more following the tools mm -hmm. than necessarily following the influencers. Totally, yeah. Um, I love Rachel Woods, yeah. uh, who has the AI exchange. She puts out some amazing content that 
is a really good summary of what's going on in AI. Cool. Um, they have a Slack community as well. Where people are always posting amazing things and, and good tips for each other there. So mm -hmm. uh, that's probably my top go-to at the moment. Are there things outside of like CS or professional content or whatever that you that you pay attention to that like influences you as a CS leader? Yeah, I mean, I, again, like not necessarily following CS specific. I right. follow probably 15 industry newsletters mm -hmm. um, that talk about what's going on in different segments of tech. Um, it kind of helps me understand what the finance landscape looks like because where yeah, the money goes, the sure. industry will follow. So um, I pick one for each industry that I really love. So like N2UK for ed tech yeah. and Rock Health for health tech. And so I've got my my list there. Feel free to DM me if you're happy to share. Send it to me. Um, I'll put it in the show notes and then, if, if anybody's interested. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, also a great way if you're looking for work, like follow the money. If they've been mm -hmm. fundraising, they're probably going to have headcount opening. It's a great way to kind of get ahead of the curve. Um I also, I really love, um, Cesar Romero does a, um, beyond the job podcast, yeah. um, which just gives me inspiration for, you know, career transitioner stories and, mm -hmm. you know, back to our boot camp roots there. I really, you know, love connecting with people who have, you know, made those transitions, not just to customer success, but just in general, kind of yeah. hearing how people can highlight their transferable skills in a really meaningful way to move mm -hmm. towards the lifestyle they want to have. That's so great. Yeah. It's a good, it's a good call out. And to your earlier point, um, Christy Faltruso also gave this advice on the podcast, which is like she, her main thing that she called out was Bloomberg. So just, just follow the money. Like that's, that's where the opportunity is. Um, one thing that actually, actually I wanted to touch on that, that we didn't touch on, um, earlier when we were talking about recast and I wanted to dig in a little bit deeper on this, uh, you know, on the, on the mission of equity, um, in the workplace, because I think it's, crazy important we've highlighted it on the show you know before with various guests you've got your finger on the pulse um and I, I feel like in cs anyway i feel like gender equity has you know has some some room to grow at the leadership level at the ic level it seems it seems pretty good but i think racial diversity still in tech and cs and everywhere is just like way off the mark. So I would love your kind of finger on the pulse um, as to what you're seeing. Yeah, thank you for highlighting that. Definitely mm -hmm. things we care a lot about. Um, yeah, when we started this company in 2020, and we started working on it, we looked at you know the, the statistics across customer success. A lot of them were still from 2019 there. At that point in time, 81% uh, of CSMs were white. 90% had a bachelor's degree or higher and 95% lived in one of 15 major metro urban areas. Wow. Um, so like a very specific demographic, which 100% did not look like my customers. Mm -hmm. um, so we've made we've made and lost some progress across those areas specifically. Um, you know, then the percentage of white CSMs now uh, is 78%. So we've made a little bit of progress there, still not fully representative of the US population. Yeah. Um, only 3% of CSMs are black, which has not, has been pretty flat over the last five years. Wow. Um, versus 13% of the US population is black. 10% yeah. um, of CSMs are Latinx, which has improved over the last few years, but still is nowhere near the 19% of the U.S. population. Um, degrees uh, has actually gone the wrong direction. Like mm. we started to see a lot of positive change in 21, 22, where the labor market was really, really tight and people stopped remove, you know, started removing that requirement. Yeah. Um, this year we've lost a ton of ground. It's back. It's mm -hmm. actually higher than it was in 2019 at 92% have a bachelor's degree or higher, which I don't think is needed. No. Uh, which also has like some implications for for diversity in you know class and. Um, I feel like status college in general things. is not needed anymore. I'm sorry. I'm just going to say it. I, I, <laughs> I know having having launched degrees for Coursera, I probably shouldn't say this out loud, but I I absolutely agree. Yeah. I think it's pretty yeah. antiquated and a totally. pretty big problem we'll have to address this generation. Uh -huh. um, the, the bright spot has been um, the urban versus 
you know, rural divide has mm -hmm. drastically changed. Um, you know, what those 15 urban areas were across about 10 states. There's now concentrations of at least 150 CSMs across 48 states. Oh, wow. um, it's just absolutely exploded. I'm really hoping we don't lose too much ground as companies are starting to pull back on yeah. uh, remote friendly roles because it makes no sense for your CSM to have to be where your headquarters are. Zero. They should be where their customers are Correct. <laughs> in the communities <laughs> that they're serving. Um, so I'm really hoping that trend doesn't, doesn't backtrack too much. Yeah. That's very interesting. Do you find that because of that, um, do you find that um, CS orgs are segmenting their customers by geographic location more than they may have in the past? Or is that not really a thing? I feel like they always did. I don't know. Maybe mm. that's just what <laughs> I've worked at. But, mm -hmm. you know, I think time zones play a lot into it. Yeah. Um, so being available the, the hours that your customers are available. But, yeah. um, and, you know, before digital was as popular, there was a lot of travel for CS. And, it, they, Tons. you know, you ideally want it local, right? Like yeah. a couple hour drive. <laughs> you know, I remember doing these crazy road shows supporting a CSM during like, quarterly business review season where we'd go down the entire Eastern seaboard and see like, I don't know, 70 customers in two weeks or something. Um, but those would all be with the customers for the East coast that were like within a, you know, within a couple hours drive of most of their customers. So I feel like CS has always been more remote friendly than other jobs in tech. And I'm yeah. really hoping as people are pulling, pulling these streams and, requiring people to come back to the office that they don't extend that to their CS teams. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, it's interesting. You, one thing that came to mind as you were talking about kind of those QBR roadshows or whatever, um, you know, the QBR, I think, makes perfect sense in an in-person environment. Obviously, you want to come prepared with a deck and with the supporting details and being in person, you want to have something to present to and et cetera, et cetera. Um, I've, I'm finding that I think uh, they're completely ineffective in a virtual kind of Zoom setting because I, I bet you your executive doesn't even want to be in the meeting. They're like, why are we all here? This could have been an email kind of thing, you know? Um, <laughs> And uh, curious to get your your take on that, um, and and if you're seeing kind of something similar, if you think something similar. Yeah, I know this isn't always the popular uh, opinion to have. It's but contentious, but, like, but but I think it's uh, you know? <laughs> we got to have the conversation, folks, because you're you're being ineffective with this yeah. stuff sometimes. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I feel like your percentage of time that you can ask from an executive should be directly proportional to the level of benefit they get from your product. So if you're mm. the payroll software and mm -hmm. your executive sponsor is the director of payroll, their job's 100% reliant on your software. Like it, yep. you play a huge part in their day to day and they really care and they want to know and they want an opportunity to ask questions. Mm -hmm. If you are, you know, a plugin for Zoom that has cute emojis, like no one wants to talk to you, right? Like, yep. uh, if you are one, uh, you know, one tenth of one percent of the budget that that executive oversees, you should not be asking for their mm -hmm. time or expecting your CSMs to get their time. Mm -hmm. um, you still need to communicate value, but sure. it should be in a proportional way that says, like, you know, here the here's a five minute video I put together that's going to quickly walk you through all of the highlights of what we're what we're doing together here yeah. if you have questions but keep up the great work you know well with that hot take because it is a hot take <laughs> i love it um it's time to wrap wrap things up but i would love for you to enlighten us on how folks can find you linkedin obviously but how can they can engage with you and all of those kinds of things yeah uh linkedin's the easiest um i Worked at LinkedIn early days, so I got I got good uh, naming there. <laughs> so it's just Annie Dean, uh, yeah. which there's a couple like much more influential Annie Deans now, but I, I stole it. So occasionally I get like congratulations on the award, and I'm like I, I don't think that's me. Uh, but yeah, yeah. So Thanks. It, LinkedIn dash <laughs> Annie Dean. Uh, <laughs> uh, if you're interested in mentoring or taking a workshop or anything like that, yeah, recastsuccess.com is probably the easiest way. 
um, mm -hmm. and conference season's over. So I don't, you know, I'm actually home for a couple months I and I'm super enjoying it. <laughs> yeah. It's amazing. It's amazing. It'll be good. Well, um, thanks for taking the time today. I know it's Friday afternoon and I might be keeping you from your weekend. Um, so I appreciate the time. It was a pleasure and, uh, you know, thanks for sharing all of your valuable insights with the listener. Yeah. Thanks for having me. I, you know, I love what you're doing for, for digital customer success. And, uh, I can't wait to see 10 years from now where people are like, you know, <laughs> back before it was a thing. <laughs> you remember when? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for joining me for this episode of the digital customer success podcast. If you like what we're doing, consider leaving us a review on your podcast platform of choice. It really helps us to grow and to provide value to a broader audience. You can view the Digital Customer Success definition word map and get more details about the show at digitalcustomersuccess.com. My name is Alex Turkovich. Thanks again for joining and we'll see you next time.